in northern New Mexico, which should be considered a living history museum, given its vast historic resources, may, many old buildings from the 1700s and 1800s are still being used. Oddly, historians and geographers, and yes, even archaeologists, generally fail to take a notice of what Turing dating can do to enhance our understanding of historical events and to check on the historical records. While religious structures have typically been tree ring dated, particularly flat roofed mission churches and flat roof buildings, the poorest selection for getting tree ring dates because flat roof, almost all flat roofs have been repaired over the years and replaced. Vernacular architecture seldom, seldom shares little interest by historians and archaeologists alike, and these are rapidly disappearing. On request, we mapped and sampled a former possible trading post on the outskirts of Taos. This was an interesting place full of beams, always like those, but more interesting, the lady was interested in having her walls replastered sometimes so those nice bulges above the doorways and along under the vigas where the bonding beams were, were fair game. So we were allowed to rip the plaster off in those places and get sample from those more important things that would date the actual construction of the structure rather than the vigas. Of course, we haven't got any dates back because it's a three year turn on most of this stuff. Three years. I had a Catholic priest call me from Socorro to date the original sanctuary doorway and pieces of an altar they found underneath the church flooring when the church was remodeled several years ago. I did not know of this remodeling, otherwise we would have gone down and probably gotten truing samples out of the exposed beams and the walls and things like that to get at the earlier dates. Probably dated in 16, 1700s. The, the doorway lentils were this big. Half of them were cottonwood, no good for dating. The others were ponderosa pine, also worthless. They had about 25 rings in them. However, the altar pieces they found under the flooring of about this size had over 100 rings in them and still reflected painting and stuff like that from the form, former altar pieces. So those I'm sure will date and we'll get something back in that in a little while. Uh, Mike Marshall, an archeologist in New Mexico, has been working at Isleta Pueblo. Uh, we dated the church a few years ago when they remodeled it, um, recorded every piece of wood in the church and sampled a wide variety of things. They're now working on the priest's quarters and the attached buildings and tearing them down. So Mike called me in and we looked at the wood there and I think when I get home here, there's gonna be a large pile of saw cut beams laying in my front yard <laughs> that a couple of my wood rats took over for me while I was in the field. So those are the kind of things going all the time, trying to keep ahead of the structure and things that are being ripped out. Um, we have three projects going on in downtown Santa Fe. The neatest for me is a lady lives up a uh, curio, um, pair of folks that own some curio shops in Santa Fe. They're right on the Sierra Madre, or the uh, uh, Asequia Madre, the mother ditch that leads into the plaza. Their house is right next to it. And incredibly enough, there's a mill run underneath that house, under their living room floor. <laughs> that probably dates to one of the three mills that were recorded in Santa Fe in the 1600s from an old map that we have. It's completely intact under the floor. They, they have a wine cellar in there now and their hot water heater and wires and junk laying all over the place, but everything's intact and so we should, we should get some pretty interesting dates out of that. Two other structures are on the plaza next to the uh, Palace of the Governors on Palace Street. Um, one housed the original check-in office for the atomic bomb project on Los Alamos in the 1940s. It is now a curio shop of about 12 rooms. The figures are 10 feet up and the place is loaded with priceless stuff. The owner wanted us to do it during commercial hours when people were coming in. So we had to get ladders in there with people wandering around us and the threat of me dropping a drill on some $5,000 object down below, you know. <laughs> It was a tense thing. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was all Vegas, and they all dated the same from the seven rooms we sampled in the 1850s. So obviously those things have been restructured. The, house, the two buildings we're talking about were, are known to have been rebuilt after the 1680 revolt. So they date somewhere in the early 1700s. 
the plaza entry and into the patio, there's some huge beams on that, probably in a wagon entrance at one time. The beam that we sampled dated at 1606. There were some very old corbels in there, but the two I sampled didn't date, but we're still continuing to work there. Next door is the shed, a very good New Mexican restaurant. They have about 50 beams, including a bunch in the kitchen. So obviously we're not gonna work there on you know, hours when people are eating. We're probably working on that and that's coming up next month. We'll take care of that and see what that turns out for us. But generally the Vegas are not very good. It's usually the stuff in the walls you need. You don't get very good results out of Kivas for dating the actual construction of these places. Okay. Um, elsewhere at San Fidel, New Mexico, outside Grants, owned by archaeologist Harding Polk of the BIA, who's out here somewhere. Um, we sampled a couple of old structures from the initial Anglo-Hispanic occupation of the area, of which the area abounds in collapsed old adobe structures. Uh, he has the samples with him in, here today, and if anybody's going to Tucson, he'd love you to take the tree samples down to the tree lab and get in line. At Abiquiu, northern New Mexico, the village home of painter Georgia O'Keefe, we did an old dilapidated Hakal structure off the plaza where the University of California, Berkeley, was digging, led by Alexandria McCleary. I hadn't a clue they were working up there. It had huge vegas, again, about like this, worthless. Again, those were happy vegas, happy pines. They had about 25 rings in them, and it just wouldn't cut it. However, the walls were stacked high with vertical pinon and juniper post, which is fairly common up there in northern New Mexico. And once they're smeared over the adobe, you'd never know that. You would think they're adobe structures. So we got a number of samples out of juniper and the, and the pinon there. So I think we'll get an idea of some of the old structures around the plaza there at Abiquiu. In southwest Colorado, we assisted archaeologist Red Polanka and his Polish crew from Krakow's Jagiellonian University to Turing sample the many cliff structures in the Canyon of the Ancients National Monument adjacent to Castle Rock off McElmo Canyon. There wasn't much wood there, it was pretty scrappy. So I hope we're gonna get something. We tested about, I think, eight structures, but most of them only had a few beams and most of them probably ripped off of the wood. Finally, we, we, content we returned to continue our long-term project work for archaeologists Cameron Cox and Don Simonis here of the BLM, uh, for our sixth year on Cedar Mesa and our fifth year in Beef Basin in southeast Utah. Our research area covers an area roughly north-south 45 miles by 25 miles or about 625 square miles. That overlaps with Ben Bellarado and Natalie Cunningham talked about yesterday on their projects. Our, our area runs from the south border of Canyonlands and Needles District down to the southern end of Cedar Mesa. It's a lot of territory and a heck of a lot of canyons. Aside from Jack Rudy's work in Beef Basin in the 1950s and visits by Bill Leip and Crow Canyon, little sustained archeological work and dendro dating has been done there for the past 60 years. We've worked on probably something like 15 sites in there the BLM wanted us to go in because the visitation was increasing in Beef Basin from Jeepers and other people. And we've pretty much taken, I guess, most of the sites that have wood on them, all prehistoric except for the Turner Ranch structures from the late 1800s. And all the ones we've worked on have been late 1200s. There's a very massive occupation there, McElmo, Mesa Verde structures, including towers, a number of towers, and a number of pinnacles spread out across the basin where people, where Mesa Verdeans have built houses and rooms along the bottom, up around the mid belt on benches and up on top of the structures. A devil to map. And not much wood for most of them either. But they're loaded with ceramics as many of the structures are not. The tower sites, for instance, have almost no cultural material with them. I realize that tourists and other people have picked up stuff, but this is beginning to intrigue me now about the loss of artifacts or the deficit artifacts found at many of the sites we work with. We also started work in Mule Canyon on Cedar Mesa, working on rock shelters there, again, due to increased visitation. 
Uh, we just finished working on a site. There was two households, two kivas. One of the kivas, even though it was in the ground, a large depressor, depression in front of the house block, had a third of the cribbed roof intact. 60 beams were recorded in that cribbed roof, and mapping them is a devil. So, but very well preserved. We got a bunch of samples of that at. We recorded something in the neighborhood, 150 structural wood samples at the site. So that should be interesting when we get dates back from that. Okay. We have also detailed mapped about 15 habitation sites, most of the ones in the various forks of, of Slickhorn Canyons on Cedar Mesa, and tallied over 400 tree ring samples. Our dating success has been very disappointing there, roughly 14 percent, and it does, and it, but it, it does reflect that sec, session of construction ended there in the early 1260s, following an article that recently came out in Kiva by R.G. Matson and Bill Leip and Diane Kierwitz, using much of our treeing data from Cedar Mesa and Natural Bridges. There's a surprising difference between the 77 success treeing date that they got in Grand Gulch, Bill Light did, in Grand, nearby Grand Gulch, as opposed to our 14%. Difference attributed in part to the selection of many larger beams in Grand Gulch and not using the small ones. In the drier area of Slickhorn in the southern Cedar Mesa, where we, where we are at the last of the conifer cover of PJ, Pinion and Juniper. These produce mainly erratic and highly stressed tree growth. So the, getting a date on some of these sites has been very tough. We've had one site also, uh, there's a lot of use of cottonwood in the southern part of the Cedar Mesa, particularly in the canyon bottoms. Uh, we had one kiva that was intact, it was all cottonwood, and a bench up above it with all kinds of structures on it with no wood. We failed to get any dates out of the thing, and I went back the next year and I got a ladder pole that was still in the kiva leaning down that I'd missed. It produced the only date for the site, but 1257, right in the group there. Very interesting stuff, but the canyon work is tough on us. And my crew is getting older. <laughs> As I my. Um, we managed to date the ladder in the edge of the Cedars Museum that came out of Perfect Kiva that we sampled and worked on at the beginning of our work there on Cedar Mesa. The ladder dated to 1242, later than the construction dates we got out of the Kiva in the room there at Perfect Kiva, but nevertheless intriguing as part of the occupation there on Cedar Mesa. As a note of caution, the recent article by Leip and Matson and others talk about households and movement of population on Cedar Mason and elsewhere. I'm starting to get disturbed because we've recorded a large number of sites that have almost no artifacts on them. Now we can attribute that to pot hunters or people picking up stuff, but I don't believe it. In some cases we're loaded with stuff and others it's like somebody has stripped them clean. There's also a large number of sites of the ones we work on that still have ghost walls, adobe marks on the ceiling where rooms used to be. And yet there's almost nothing left of that masonry, anything of the house, and no artifacts. So you know what's going on here? I hesitate to call some of those habitation sites. They may have kivas, they may have living rooms and so forth, but the lack of artifacts disturbs me. This is primarily McElmo and Mesa Verde area. I got one in Chaco, a two-story structure that I recorded with the rock art folks a few years ago. You can see it was built up against the cliff face and you can see the post holes and limit the individual rooms. It was built on the shaley deposits at the bottom. There wasn't one piece of mortar left from that structure, not one masonry block from the architecture. The trash was out there, roughly 15, 50 or so sherds, a couple of monos. But the architecture was completely gone. So I'm beginning to suspect a lot of this stuff is being cleared up, cleaned up, and carried off as some kind of systematic removal pattern. It does, in fact, impact our understanding of population movement and so forth across the area. So we're sort of working on that. Friends of Cedar Mesa are helping to sponsor us to raise money. If anybody has money they want to give us, go to the Friends of Cedar Mesa because somebody has to pay for the shearing dates and I'm probably 20,000 bucks in a hole. Thank you.